Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm afraid I do not bring pictures of angry German bankers. Um, I, it did not occur to me. I should have. I'm sure there are many. Uh, I do bring you, however, uh, the same indignation that Peter has towards uh, Trichet and the performance of the ECB uh, throughout the early stages of the crisis. And I also bring you a prophet. And that prophet is not Wayne Godley, but it's Baron Lanfalussy, the first president well, not the president of the European Monetary Institute, the, the precursor of the European Central Bank. And I want to make three points today that I think are uh, important um, when we think about uh, macroeconomic policy in the euro area, uh, and that are blind spots. We don't typically talk about them, uh, and I think we should. And the first point is that in the euro area, and before the euro area, uh, we pushed for financial integration, uh, and in doing so, we uh, promoted shadow banking through both the Lanfalusi process in securities markets and through the actions of the ECB. And uh, the rise of uh, market-based finance, which is a version, or uh, shadow banking is a, a version of market-based finance, brings us to the second point, which is the importance uh, and the neglect of the monetary power of collateral, which is the ability of collateral securities to support the shadow banking system in the same way that central bank reserves support the banking system. Okay? Uh, and that matters a lot when we think about uh, monetary and fiscal policy, because the neglect of the monetary po uh, power of collateral uh, in both monetary policy and fiscal policy has eroded the ability and the fiscal space of several euro area countries and has given us the, the kind of configuration of macroeconomic policies that both speakers complained about, which is we got conditional monetary activism uh, in the euro area and we got a lot of austerity. So I'm approaching this uh, presentation uh, through a critical macrofinance lens. This is a theoretical framework that I'm developing, and it starts from a very uh, important uh, insight by Hyman Minsky, that is that changing financial structures uh, in wh whatever uh, jurisdiction affects the uh, uh, effectiveness of monetary policy. And there are th five, uh, four key points there. One is that uh, a critical macrofinance approach treats finance as a global phenomena that is increasingly organized around securities market-based finance. And if you read Adam Tuzzi's book, you will know a lot about it. Uh, I, we treat money as a debt, uh, debt and money as a balance sheet relationship between uh, banks and shadow banks, and that's very important, that have different investment models, and who need new types of money in order to uh, find safety because the traditional banking system and traditional bank liabilities do not serve them. Okay? So that's the theoretical approach. And I want to go to the, to the first blind spot. That is that for a variety of political and um, monetary policy reasons, since, to, since the late 1990s, the euro area policymakers have, pushed, have promoted shadow banking. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, the uh, prophet, uh, Baron Lanfalussy, in 2000, when he was very influential in, in um, uh, technocratic European circles, he argued that we have seen an accelerated move to a market-centric financial system from a bank-centric financial system, and that's great, uh, he thought, because it is more efficient. Uh, and he said the idea of efficiency comes from the fact that market-based finance in a monetary union can harmonize borrowing costs for, for firms and households and can also harmonize borrowing costs for governments. And the logic there was that uh, euro area countries, in order to improve the transmission mechanism of monetary policy and to improve liquidity in their government bond markets, should remake the, the architecture of government bond markets after the blueprint, blueprint of the US Treasury market, that is, with a repo market attached to it. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a second what that is. Just to say that Baron Lanfalussy's ambitions got fulfilled uh, quite impressively, but in an unexpected way. A lot of market-based finance that we got in Europe, we got on the balance sheet of large European banks. And this is a, from the Likanen report, if you haven't read it, I think it's a great uh, insight into how European banking has changed dramatically uh, over the, since uh, the introduction of the euro, moving away from what we think about banks as these traditional institutions that create credit by lending to households and businesses directly, and they create deposits in the process. So, 
What is shadow banking? Probably it's time to clarify it for those of you who need refreshing. Shadow banking, I'm using here a definition that, has, that is used by a variety of uh, authors in the shadow banking literature. It, it should be understood as a market-based finance, as the production uh, and financing of tradable securities. Uh, and to give, you an ex to give you an example, this is how the, shadow, how the European Systemic Risk Board reports shadow banking across entities, and those go from investment funds to other types of financial institutions and across uh, activities. And shadow banking related market activities, there are securities financing transactions, the use of derivatives, and the use of financial collateral. In other words, to sort of uh, paraphrase Perry Merling's definition of shadow banking, that is repo and derivative market funding of securities market lending. It's a financial system organized around capital markets where, and, where, and where positions in capital markets are financed through repos and derivatives. Okay. And as we see from this graph, Baron Lanfalusi's ambitions and, and an entire project of the European, uh, of, the, of the Euro area in terms of changing the nature of the financial system work quite well. We typically think about securities financing transactions or about the repo market. We think of it, it was very large and very systemic in the, uh, in the US. And that's where the uh, crisis in the Lehman Brothers exploded and became a global financial crisis. But if you compare with the euro area, you can see that basically Euro European repo markets were as large as US repo markets by 2008. And uh, repo liabilities, that is promises to pay made by banks uh, and, and uh, shadow banks against uh, securities collateral, were as large as broad money by 2008 in uh, stocks. And you see they start to fall afterwards, and that's part of the story. So why did shadow banking in this definition of acti activities, why did it grow so fast? It grew fast for a variety of reasons, because of uh, financial globalization, because European banks were moving towards activities in capital and derivatives markets, and because the ECB had a particular interest in pushing the growth of, of repo markets. And here uh, I have a quote from a 2002 paper where the ECB explains its position, and it says it's very important for the, for the success, successful transmission mechanism of monetary policy, that we think about the way in which financial markets are treating government securities issued by euro area, right? And the ECB said it's important because there are different ratings, there are different liquidities, and what we will do in order to promote the integration of the repo market so trans, the transmission mechanism works well, is to treat all government bonds issued by euro area countries as equivalent collateral. In other words, if you... Uh, or a bank in 2003 who wanted to borrow from the ECB, you could give Greek collateral or Greek government bonds or German bonds, and they would be treated absolutely identically. Okay. The ECB also helped or, or tried to push the integration of the repo market, and that is try to push the European financial system more towards shadow banking by adopting the kind of repo market practices that we see in private uh, shadow banking. You, as you, if you compare the way in which monetary policy implementation was designed uh, uh, before or worked before, 2000 and before uh, the introduction of euro and after, you will see that the ECB, the, the, the independent euro system banks did not mark to market and did not do collateral risk management until the euro comes. And then uh, the ECB and the EU uh, 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 harmonizes practices to look exactly like the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve. And this is important because marking to market and making margin calls creates or feeds into liquidity and, and leverage cycles for private financial institutions because when securities prices are increasing and you mark your repo positions to market, you get more collateral back and you can borrow against them. When securities prices are falling, you're in trouble because whoever you borrowed from is going to give you a, a ring and say, send me more collateral. And if, and if you don't have it, you're in, you're in trouble and you have to start selling it. And, and this is very critical to understanding the role of the ECB in, uh, after Lehman and the way in which the, the banking crisis triggered by activities of, uh, of European banks in shadow banking in the US became a, a sovereign debt crisis in the Euro area. Okay. The outcome uh, of a very significant push by um, the European Central Bank and by the European Commission, so it's not ev everybody was working uh, and singing from the same, uh, from the same uh, sort of tune, was that uh, by, by 2008, 
in securities portfolios in the euro area, and they were quite significant, were financed through collateral portfolios that in treated equally AAA government bonds or euro area periphery government bonds. In other words, we have, if you're familiar with the conversations and discussions about the single safe asset in the euro area, we did have one before 2008 created through the European repo market. Uh, and you will ask yourself, why did governments in the euro area accept this? What is the reason for allowing your uh, government bonds to be part of the shadow banking system through the repo market? And the answer is very simple, and it, it is still a simple answer that prevents a very significant regulation of the repo market. The logic is if your government bonds are used in repo markets, you get more trading because banks and shadow banks can finance those government bonds through uh, repos. And because you get more trading, you get more liquidity, you get more liquidity, you get less volatility and lower financing costs. It's a perfect uh, liquidity promise that shadow banking made to euro area government bonds. And we will see it was a, a promise that only holds during good times. Okay. And uh, just to note here, what we see is that the euro area repo market grew very large, around 7 trillion. 80% of those 7 trillion repo liabilities or new types of monetary liabilities were uh, uh, collateralized by government bonds issued by euro area governments. Okay. And this brings me to the, second to the second blind spot of trying to work through if this is the macro financial structure that we created in the euro area deliberately, why, what, how does it play in the crisis or in a crisis of shadow banking? And this, uh, uh, I would, I like to think about this through the concept of the monetary power of collateral. That is the I, I ability of uh, securities that are used as collateral to preserve their high quality during bad times. That is very fundamental to the way in which a shadow banking crisis unfolds. And here our prophet is coming back again. Uh, Lamfalusi said in 2000, well, yeah, it's great that we are getting a market-based financial system because it is more efficient. The question is, is it more stable? And he was right to worry about it because we know now from a lot of research done on shadow banking that market-based finance or financial systems organized around securities, derivatives, and repo markets are significantly more fragile because they increase the amplitude of leverage and liquidity cycles for the euro area. They also increase the exposure to U.S. funding conditions. We also know that market-based finance produces banks who are significantly more complex to manage and significantly more difficult politically to allow to fail. So European banks, as the Likanen report confirms, ended up being too large, too complex, and too interconnected through the shadow banking universe. And then what we discovered with the crisis of the Lehman Brothers is that sh cr shadow banking crises work very differently in the sense that we get runs on the repo market through these margin calls because of the vo uh, fluctuating price of securities. We get fire sales of collateral securities leading to liquidity and haircut spirals. And we get run runs on collateral markets. And in the US, we got these runs on collateral markets where collateral were asset-backed securities or mortgage-backed securities that seemed to be AAA, but when the crisis came and liquidity disappeared, uh, were actually uh, impossible to trade. However, and this is where Baron Lanfalussi was, was very wrong, he said it doesn't matter if this system is less stable because we have government debt. And as long as government debt is used as collateral, in the shadow banking universe, we will be fine because uh, government bonds preserve their liquidity during good and bad times. You don't get fire sales, you don't get runs, and you don't get a, 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 any of the destabilizing dynamics that we, would ha we did have in the case of the Lehman Brothers. And how do we know he was wrong? Well, we, we know he was wrong because we have a lot of evidence now from a particular type of shadow banks that are called uh, central clearing counterparties that are intermediating a lot more of the uh, shadow banking system now on, on their balance sheet. We saw here how LCH ClearNet, very, very large CCP, increased its haircuts or made it much more expensive to finance with Irish government bonds and then with Portuguese government bonds. And when you can't finance Irish and Portuguese government bonds in the repo market, you're in trouble and you will not hold these bonds and fire sales will start. The same in the second for a Eurex clearing who is based here in Germany, we see the same increases in haircuts uh, as we had for uh, in LCH ClearNet. 
And what is more interesting here is not only that private shadow banks were eroding the monetary power of sovereign collateral, but also the ECB. And here where the story of Trichet deserving the prize of the World Central Bank in the world, I think, comes in again. What we see here is that the standard narrative we have about central banking in crisis is that the ECB was great because it expanded the range of collateral that will, it will accept. Some people were sometimes joking that it accepted these gold euro coins with, with chocolate inside. You could have posted it as, a, as collateral. Well, probably that would have been a better idea than posting Greek government bonds because Greek government bonds were far more expensive. And we see here uh, the ECB making margin calls on the commercial banks that it was lending to. In other words, instead of playing the lender of last resort, during bad times and providing liquidity to the banking system, he was asking for more liquidity from banks who didn't, uh, had the wrong kind of collateral. Okay? And there is a lot of debate there, and I, I know some ECB uh, researchers who deny or, or disagree with this story, with this interpretation, but if you look at the way in which the market value of collateral posted at the ECB sort of fluctuates over time, what you will see that up to 2012, when Mario Draghi comes in, the, although the collateral expansion should have generated more availability of funding for the banking system there in blue, actually the, the mark-to-market activities of the ECB in red were reducing the amount of collateral that commercial banks were able to use in order to borrow from the ECB. In other words, the ECB was making things worse instead of making things better. And that's very important as an aside to the story of Trichet raising interest rates in 2011. This was systematically, systematic pressure on the European banking system because mark to market happens on a, on a daily basis. And if the prices of securities you post as collateral falls, you get calls every day. It's a bit worse, well, in my view, much worse in terms of uh, funding stress than simply raising interest rates. Okay, and we know we also have confirmation increasingly from research done by the central banks. Bank de France is very interesting. It's the only central bank in the euro system that does serious research on this. I don't understand the politics of this, but that's what we have. And Bank de France says, yes, the ECB claims that it, it didn't matter, uh, these margin uh, calls and haircuts for government bonds didn't matter because we allowed banks to hold, to be over collateralized, to hold a lot more collateral by posting their loan portfolios. But the research of people who actually have access to the, the, the database of uh, uh, individual bank holdings at the ECB show that, in, in fact, eligibility criteria, in other words, if the ECB says, I'm going to accept Greek government bonds as collateral, and remember at some point it's, it decided not to, and that's very important, and in terms of democratic accountability, very, very problematic, uh, we know that, that individual banks were coming under a lot of pressure from the, uh, the particular design of the collateral framework of the ECB. They, they, and more importantly, we know that government bonds were coming under a lot of pressure from the design of the collateral framework because the signal of the signals that the ECB was sending private markets. So here the, the paper says the eligibility of certain assets as collateral is likely to impact their relative degree of liquidity compared to non-eligible assets and, and hence to alter the incentives to hold them. So remember, this is a paper written by a central bank. It went through various processes of, of uh, uh, checking the writing, but still I think it makes a very good case that the decisions of the ECB of how to treat government bonds, individual government bonds issued by euro area countries, matters for their liquidity. And in other words, central bank decisions have very clear fiscal implications if we think through the shadow banking lens. And this brings me to the importance of considering both monetary policy and fiscal policy and the interactions of, uh, between these two through shadow banking. Okay? And it's not only me who worries about this. There are lots of different statements uh, from very high-level um, European technocrats uh, that worry about the way in which the European crisis unfolded through the shadow banking system, and it left only a handful of countries with uh, collateral that has monetary power. And I don't think you need the, uh, you, you won't get a prize if you guess which is the country who, who issues that particular bond that has the greatest monetary power. It's Germany. And I think that's very important for us understanding why Germany is refusing so stubbornly, was refusing so stubbornly to accept uh, uh, ECB uh, interventions. Uh, Novotny, who used to be the head of the uh, Austrian Central Bank, uh, makes the same case that beyond the unconventional monetary policies, we need to worry about the moneyness of safe assets, which is another way of saying we need to worry about 
the monetary, policy, uh, the monetary power of, of collateral. And that's very interesting because in a world of shadow banking, it's something very, very par paradoxical occurs. Because government bonds can play the role of high quality collateral, they, the, the treasury that issues these government bonds becomes a de facto shadow ce central bank for the shadow banking system. And Peter Fisher, who was responsible for monetary policy uh, operations at the Federal Reserve and then uh, at the US Treasury, makes this case in, in, a, in, a, in a paper very clearly to me that government bonds are a base asset in the same way that central bank reserves are a, are a base asset for the banking system. And we have one central bank who has acknowledged that in practice. In other words, it, it, it recognized the importance of changing the monetary policy framework to reflect the new financial structures organized through shadow banking, and that's the Bank of England. And Bank of England in 2015 said, I, we will ex expand our monetary po policy framework and we will act as a market maker of last resort. This is very different from a lender of last resort because a market maker of last resort doesn't lend through repos in long-term refinancing operations like the ECB da did and then makes margin calls and recreates the same funding pressures, but it intervenes directly in securities markets. And by intervening directly in securities markets, it preserves the liquidity and it preserves the monetary uh, power of that particular security, of that particular collateral. The, the Bank of England could do that because the political constraints around changing your monetary policy are very different in the UK as they are in, in the euro area. But what we know from looking at the, the way in which monetary policy implementation, uh, monetary policy operations change the ECB, we know very clearly that the only, and very paradoxically, that the most successful unconventional monetary policy of the ECB was one that was never put in practice. So think through that. Why is it that outright monetary transactions stopped banking uh, pressures? Why is it that we see there uh, uh, differentials between high, uh, between sovereigns from the periphery and sovereigns from the core are starting to, to uh, um, uh, fall? And you will see that this happens way be before QE, right? So outright monetary transactions from the ECB, which was an announcement to buy if they had to, is a way, or is equivalent to a market maker of last resort, and what, it was what was finally necessary, what Jean-Claude Trichet did not want to do, but Mario Draghi did when he said, whatever it takes. So, what is the lesson of this? And I want to bring you, uh, I want to bring this to a close by noting that what we have, we had in the euro area, and we should think very carefully when we uh, evaluate monetary policy and fiscal policy decisions, what we had, uh, uh, is a series of phenomena that now we're trying to study very, very carefully that I think are the unintended effects of deliberate policy choices to reorganize European finance around capital and repo markets. The sovereign bank loop, there is a growing literature on it, the transformation of the banking crisis into a sovereign debt crisis, the discussion of redenomination risks, the fragmentation of government bond markets and austerity are all consequences of choices we made in the way in which we organize the financial uh, uh, structure of the euro area. And why does this matter? Because we put in place a new type of financial system without putting in place the appropriate institutional architecture to stabilize it. And we know that there are now a series of efforts uh, and of policy measures to try to deal with this. Some of them are trying to reverse market-based finance and shadow banking. Uh, the financial transactions tax was never implemented, but it, went in, it would have gone into that direction. The bank structure reform directive following the insights of the Likanen report was also never implemented because, and here I would make a side, because of the political power of, uh, of finance in, in the euro area, both of banks and of, of shadow banks. We then me have measures to contain shadow banking, and that, those go, go from, in the, euro, in the euro area, we have a uh, new directive that says, okay, we won't regulate European repo markets, but we will make them transparent. I, I think you know this story, it happens a lot when the political compromise uh, can only f collapse into a, a transparency or a disclosure uh, decision. We have Basel III, the measures in Basel III re regarding liquidity and leverage are measures specifically directed to uh, target or to preserve a, a shadow banking stability. And 
I know there are many who argue banking union is going into the same direction. I personally think the banking union was not as important to stabilize European finance as outside monetary transactions or um, other uh, sort of uh, initiatives uh, geared towards shadow banking. We are going back, actually, since 2015 towards promoting more shadow banking in the Capital Markets Union initiative and uh, into the effort to take away from Germany what it has gained through our process of promoting shadow banking. Germany has gained a very important political advantage in the euro area by simply the way in which we organize our financial structure. Because Germany is, in, is enjoying an exorbitant benefit of issuing a, a, a safe asset for the entire euro area without really wanting to do it or without having the policy framework under which this could be done. In other words, financial stability in, euro, in the euro area depends a lot on the availability of German bonds during uh, bad times. And because everybody runs into German bonds and into the French uh, government bonds as well, but because everybody runs into German bonds during bad times, Germany has no incentive to give up the debt break. Because why would you? During bad times, everybody comes to you. It's fine. I don't need to change anything. So what we have now is a macrofinancial mix that is very problematic for the euro area. Because we have monetary activism, that we know. Outright monetary transactions are here to stay. But they are coming with conditionality. Nobody, not including Madame Lagarde, is going to pr promise to support a particular government bond like Italy is without writing a really, really long letter of structural reforms that the ECB is expecting Italy to do. And I uh, have my doubts about allowing technocrats in the, in the central bank to make decisions that have to do with democratic politics. The combination of mo conditional monetary activism comes with fiscal austerity because Governments are exposed to the vulnerabilities and to the shocks that come from shadow banking, but they have no tools to control them. And there, is, there are quite a few, sort of present, uh, quite a few uh, insights from Bank of Italy and from the debt manager of, from the uh, Italian Treasury that recognizes that getting involved into a mar marriage with the repo market might not have been a good idea because that marriage turned out to be far more destabilizing and there is nobody to sort of coordinate and, and settle it. So what do we need, and I'm going to finish with this and remind you, uh, as, as I promised myself I will do, once I convert it to the climate crisis, I will live in a climate crisis, and we need, we need a very different approach to how we organize our macrofinancial architecture and what do we do about dealing with the financial crisis. What we need, per, because of the way in which we structured European finance, we need more coordinated monetary and fiscal policy, and in the particular case of financing the transition to a low carbon economy, we need coordinated monetary and fiscal activism. That is very clear to me. I'm not sure that is what we're going to get. But the European financial system and European banking will not survive without a liquid and transparent government bond market. And I'm not using here bond market just for Germany. Everybody needs the same. Otherwise, the fiscal room for maneuver for periphery countries is limited. And then more and more periphery countries will do what the, my, my adoptive country is struggling to do, which is to leave. Uh, I will finish with that. Thank you. <laughs>